What I want to start out with um, is, first of all, very important to emphasize that, that we're, what we're really talking about when we're talking about sanctions is economic warfare. Uh, and so that's why I'm calling this, you know, it's really U.S. economic warfare against Venezuela. Now, in the case of Venezuela, there had been a lot of talk for a long time about uh, the, um, the existence of economic warfare against that country. Actually, since, ever since Chavez was first elected in 98, people had been talking about it, but it became much more intense, really, uh, with uh, the election of Nicolas Maduro after Chavez died in 2013 and the election of Nicolas Maduro. The idea of economic warfare became very intense and very uh, applied to uh, very much applied to the case of Venezuela. And the reason for that was that Venezuela started suffering from a sharp economic downturn. Now, the exact causes and, uh, of that downturn, I don't have time to get into. And um, so, uh, which is unfortunate in a way, because I think it's important for people to understand, and I've written about that before, and others have written about it, and I encourage you to, to look at that, especially for the real news. I did a special um, uh, presentation on uh, the economic downturn in Venezuela. Uh, but uh, I, but we're going to focus here on is, uh, well, the, the idea that there's actually two types of economic warfare. So the first type, which I think is what led to the first economic crisis in Venezuela that began already in 2013, 2014, uh, you could call capital-sponsored uh, economic warfare. That is, we're basically talking about ca the problem of capital flight, capital strike, and actually normal capitalism in the context of trying to build a different society, of trying to build an uh, an uh, anti-capitalist or socialist society. Um, because it's uh, really, you know, capitalism already is economic war of one sort or another, of a war of, of everyone against everyone, uh, where people are constantly trying to maximize their profits and undermine uh, the well-being of other people for their own profit. So it really, that is already a form of economic warfare. And as I said, I, I'm not going to be talking about that uh, aspect, but I think it's very, very important to keep that in mind, that this is uh, a form of economic warfare that we're constantly living under, and that gets much worse when a country tries to move away from uh, normal uh, capitalism. The second kind, which is the topic of this uh, talk, is what I would call state-sponsored economic war. Um, that is the, a state targeting another country's economy via sanctions. Now, um, <coughs> now I would say that for to, to deserve the designation of warfare, only e truly economically powerful states can actually apply this, um, or a grouping of states. Now, that's why I wouldn't think, for example, that you could call um, necessarily the, uh, the sanctions against South Africa or against Israel uh, something like economic warfare. It just doesn't reach that level by any means <laughs> of the concept. Um, it's really a whole nother ballgame when a state such as the United States tries to apply uh, economic warfare against a country. And we'll see that in a moment, why this is the case. Uh, so, and the United States, of course, given its centrality in the global economic system, is extremely powerful in this regard and extremely capable of applying the uh, uh, economic warfare against a country and putting pressure on it. Uh, and uh, it's usually applied against uh, countries not only that are trying to move away from uh, capitalism, that is, uh, you know, trying to develop some form of socialism or anti-capitalist society, but it's also targeted against countries that undermine the imperial ambitions of the United States. Uh, and uh, that's why I think Iran is actually one of the targets, and, and Russia, because they're trying to counterbalance the U.S. imperialism with their own independent foreign policy. And that is undermining, basically, U.S. Uh, efforts to dominate the world. And that's why they've become targets. Anyway, turning to Venezuela. Now, there are several different types of sanctions that have been imposed. And I'll go through them relatively quickly because we don't have that much time. But um, they actually started already in May of 2006. And that's when sanctions were imposed against Venezuela for its arms purchases. Now, um, of course, most of us who are anti-war um, anti uh, you know, might think that this is not a big deal. But of course, Venezuela wanted, uh, did see itself as being threatened by the United States and wanted to uh, renew and improve its, uh, 
uh, its ability to defend itself. And so Chavez went on a buying spree, actually, at the time that the uh, price of oil was very high, which was actually at its highest level in 2006, uh, 2005. Uh, and, uh, and, and so there was money to spend, basically, on uh, arms purchases, and the United States basically cut Venezuela off. Now, why is this a problem? Well, Venezuela's entire military arsenal was previously, under previous governments, had been bought from the United States. So all the replacement parts uh, and all the kind of complementary equipment had to come from the United States, whether it's munitions or whatever. And so it couldn't do that. So it basically had to completely renew its nuclear, uh, its, its, its uh, not nuclear, its, uh, its military arsenal uh, by going elsewhere, which is of course much more expensive than if it could just repair the stuff that it already had. So that already has a major impact on its economy because it ended up spending much more than uh, Venezuela otherwise would have. Then in May 2011, uh, Venezuela's oil company PDVSA or PDVSA as it's usually called. Uh, was prohibited from competing with, uh, for U.S. government procurement contracts, from securing financing of the Export-Import Bank of the United States, and from uh, obtaining U.S. export licenses. So this is already an important restriction on uh, the Venezuelan oil company from doing business in the United States. Now, it could still sell its oil, but that was basically it. It couldn't uh, do, uh, go beyond that. Then. Um, with under the Obama administration, the second kind of um, step of uh, sanctioning Venezuela came in March of 2015, when uh, President Obama imposed a whole series of um, sanctions against individuals, uh, basically against government officials. At first, it started with only 11. In the meantime, that list has uh, expanded to several hundred. Um, we don't know the exact number, but I think it's uh, something like three or 400 individuals. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, though, according to US law, US law, and this, I'll come back to this at the end of my presentation, US law stipulates that the only way the United States can impose sanctions on another country is if it declares that the country represents an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States. Now, this is basically a statement that the US government has to do, a certification of sorts, has to, that it has to do and has done for every country that it has sanction, uh, levied sanctions against. Um, and of course, on the face of it, it's of course ridiculous uh, that uh, Venezuela represented an unusual and extraordinary threat to the national security of the United States. But, so, uh, but uh, you know, the Obama administration and then the Trump administration didn't care about that nicety and imposed uh, that designation anyway in order to impose the sanctions. Then the next major uh, sharpening of the sanctions took place in August 2017, when uh, the Trump administration prohibited uh, US citizens and US institutions from uh, engaging any kind of debt tra uh, transactions of Venezuelan debt. Now, this had major implications for Venezuela's ability to restructure its debt. Um, Normally, uh, when a government has a foreign debt, um, it's not evenly distributed. It's uh, <clears throat> the different, you know, there were contracted, uh, different amounts were uh, incurred in different moments of time at different interest rates. And so the repayment schedule can become uh, very complicated and difficult because all of a sudden a government can find itself in the position of having to pay uh, a huge sum of money all at once. Uh, because of the way that uh, debt was originally uh, constructed in the beginning. And, uh, and so it, um, no, what normal governments do, especially when they're in an economic crisis, is restructure that debt, basically roll it over. Well, Venezuela wasn't able to do that anymore with these sanctions. The other consequence, though, which is very important and which is very poorly documented, but it has been very, very important, is that um, the prohibition against um, engaging in or trading in Venezuelan debt ends up having ripple effects throughout uh, the financial system and doesn't just affect Venezuelan uh, bonds, uh, the issuing and selling and bu the buying and selling of bonds, uh, but actually has, uh, ends up uh, closing bank accounts of all kinds. Because as soon as a bank suspects that the holder of that bank account or that uh, the holder of that bank account might be engaging in transactions uh, of Venezuelan debt, well, they're going to close that account which also meant a gradual closing of Venezuelan bank accounts across the board in the United States or any bank that uh, is affiliated with the United States. 
Um, and so, so this, this is actually I should mention. So we'll see later in the in some statistics and some graphs that this was the that August was really the big turning point uh, in terms of uh, the economic effects on Venezuela because of that. And finally, the, another huge turning point, though, came in January of 2019, when the US government decided to recognize uh, the self-proclaimed uh, president of Venezuela, uh, Juan Guaido, as interim president, uh, which meant not recognizing President Nicolas Maduro, who had been elected in uh, May of uh, 2018. And um, what that meant is basically turning over any assets that, Venezuela, that the Venezuelan state has uh, turning those assets over to uh, Juan Guaido and his representatives. Um, and not only that, you know, sanctions were also imposed on PDVSA and basically uh, prohibited, uh, pre prevented PDVSA from selling uh, oil to the United States. The United States represented one third of uh, Venezuela's oil export market, and that was all of a sudden gone from one month to the next. Well, there was a gradual, uh, actually I shouldn't say one month, it was, took a three month period of uh, declining, uh, of transitioning. Um, and that was mainly to protect US refineries, not to protect the Venezuelan economy. Um, the other thing that, uh, the other consequence, of course, is that Venezuela owns Citgo, uh, with, you know, the, the gasoline chain, which has over 7,000 uh, franchises throughout the United States and sells basically Venezuelan oil, uh, and ha provided something like $1 billion in dividends to Venezuela every year. And so that was no longer uh, allowed either. So the immediate effects. Like I said, was first of all a restructuring, uh, preventing a restructuring of Venezuelan debt, a massive decline in Venezuelan oil production. Um, Venezuelan oil production had already started to decline when the price of oil went down, as we'll see in some graphs later. Uh, this is not unusual, especially in, cir in circumstances of economic crisis. When, oil, uh, when the price of oil goes down, that means less money is available for reinvesting in the oil industry in order to make sure that the, um, that the oil rigs are still fully operational because they need to be replaced constantly, and that's a massive investment. So when the price of oil goes down, especially when the company, the oil company, doesn't have a large savings account, which is the case of PDVSA, then, uh, the, uh, then it, that means an immediate decline in, the product, uh, in, in its ability to produce oil as well. Uh, so you have a double whammy, in a sense, of uh, declining revenues because of a lower price, but also declining, uh, <coughs> declining um, production. Um, and this, of course, since Venezuela depends to 95% on oil from its, uh, uh, for its uh, foreign export earnings, this uh, is a massive reduction in the amount of money it has available for imports. Um, and Venezuela imports almost everything that is needed for electricity generation, water treatment, and transportation. And then the third point that I already mentioned is uh, the closing of Venezuelans, Venezuela's foreign bank accounts. Um, and this was actually augmented with a warning uh, to the banks in September of 2017 that they would be aiding in money laundering and corruption and could be liable if they maintained Venezuelan bank accounts open. Now, of course, um, so this has nothing to do with overt sanctions. These are under the uh, you know, uh, un uh, covert sanctions, essentially, because they're not published, they're not made public. They're based solely on uh, US uh, government officials calling up the managers of banks and threatening them, essentially, to, and, for, and, uh, and pressuring them to close the bank accounts. Um, and so, of course, that also meant uh, very, it was very difficult, if not impossible, for Venezuela to stabilize its economy, which at that point had already entered a phase of hyperinflation. So here we have a graph that show, give, it compares Venezuelan oil production to that of uh, Colombia's. And the reason to make that comparison is to see you know, the, 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 two, the line in between. So the, so the dark blue line is Colombia's, uh, sorry, the, you know, the blue line is Colombia's oil production, and the black line is Venezuela's oil production. So the price of oil started going down in early 2016. And you see both countries uh, suddenly had a drop in oil production. Colombia stabilized after a while. Venezuela started crashing right after uh, the US passes uh, its financial sanctions against Venezuela in August 2017. Um, here's another comparison. This one is Argentina and Venezuela. Uh, same basic idea, oil uh, the red line being Argentina, it declined slightly uh, during the decline of oil prices, and then a massive decline for uh, Venezuela and a stabilization for Argentina uh, when the US uh, sanctions were imposed. 
Uh, there's another graph to show you also how, how massively the um, uh, January 2019 sanctions hit. Uh, so Venezuela was at the you know, beginning was producing 1,237 or 1,237,000 barrels per day and it declined to 732. That is a, um, a huge loss in revenues for Venezuela. Uh, I mean, almost a halving actually of oil production. The other economic effects of it is, of course, as I mentioned, Venezuela was cut off from its main export market, um, the hyperinflation, and then assets were blocked. Well, uh, and now this is just a partial list, actually, of access that, uh, access, uh, assets that had been blocked. $9 billion in gold reserves could not be, cannot be accessed, $3.4 billion in trade credits, $5.2 billion uh, is the value of CITGO, which cannot be accessed. Uh, $1.2 billion in gold that is held by the Bank of England. Uh, and now also it cannot access uh, correspondent banks, which are used basically for financial transactions in order to input uh, goods and foods and medicine. Now, <clears throat> I, have to, I have to hurry up because my time is practically up. <laughs> but uh, this, as I said, had massive impacts on Venezuelan infrastructure. We saw this first already during the power and, uh, and water shortages that happened and outages on public transportation because of the uh, Venezuela's inability to import um, uh, replacement parts for uh, buses, cars, or even the subway system. For food consumption, food imports declined from $11.2 billion to $2.5 billion between 2013 and 2018. So you have shortages there. Uh, and of course, the most vulnerable populations are affected first by all of this. Um, and now uh, Mark Weisbrot and Jeffrey Sachs did a calculation that mort mortality probably increased because of these sanctions. Now, this is not a cause and effect relationship. This is a correlation. Uh, but uh, that is mortality increased between 2017 and 2018, uh, exactly the time that, um, that the sanctions were imposed. And this would have meant something like 40,000 additional deaths. The, the most logical um, kind of inference one can make from this, or the, as for, for how this, what this connection is, is that um, is the lack of access to medicines. 300,000 Venezuelans are risk, at risk because of lack of access to medicines, such as uh, 80,000 people with HIV, 4 million with diabetes who cannot get access to insulin or have a hard time getting access to it now, and 16,000 who are uh, with cancer. Uh, according to uh, the Venezuelan Medical Federation, about a third of uh, Venezuelan doctors have actually left the country in the meantime, so it's an additional complication. Um, and of course, there's the migration uh, that people talk about now. These numbers are disputed uh, by the Venezuelan government, uh, and, and I think they have good reason to dispute it, 3.5 million having left the country because the numbers come from Colombia and from Brazil, which are right-wing governments and, and are very interested in inflating the numbers for their own interests. Uh, but even if it's a, only half that amount, which I think would be uh, very plausible, it's still a significant exodus of people. Well, I don't have time to go into the illegality, but the point I want to make uh, at the end is uh, really that uh, sanctions are, a for, are an act of war. And actually, Mike Pompeo, at the very, uh, a couple months, uh, two months ago, said something really quite amazing. He said, uh, when he was asked in a press conference about the sanctions, he said that the circle is tightening, the humanitarian crisis is increasing by the hour. I talked with a senior person on the ground. Um, you can see the increasing pain and suffering that the Venezuelan people are suffering for. I mean, he's talking specifically here about the sanctions and the effect of sanctions. And so this goes completely, he was basically admitting that this is the aim of the sanctions uh, and uh, all this bullshit that they keep on talking about, how they are just pressuring the government is complete nonsense. Thank you.